Good day. About a week ago, I did a program about the relationship between Turkey and the United States and about the uh, failed summit meeting between President Erdogan of Turkey and President Biden of the United States on the fringes of the General Assembly session in New York, the UN General Assembly session in New York. And I said that the effect of that failed summit meant that Turkey and Erdogan, apparently spurned by the United States, appeared to be intending to tilt more closely with, to, towards Russia, um, whose president, Vladimir Putin, President Erdogan of Turkey, was due to meet in the re Russian resort city of Sochi a few days later. Well, that meeting in Sochi has come and gone, and we have seen photographs of the two leaders, Putin and Erdogan, with all, all, all smiling with each other. But also we have had no joint statement from the Turks and the Russians following that meeting, no joint communique and no press conference. Now, that fact, the fact that there's been no joint communique and no uh, joint press conference, um, suggests a number of possibilities. It could be, for example, that Putin and Erdogan found themselves facing ma major disagreements at the summit meeting, and they don't want the world to know about that. They don't want to, the world to know that the summit was actually a failure. Well, we've got good reasons to think otherwise, as we'll come to in a moment. It seems more likely that the reason that there was no joint communique and no joint news conference is because in the three hours that Putin and Erdogan talked to each other, all sorts of plans, proposals and ideas that the Turks and the Russians have probably been working on for some time all came together and the, the Russians and the Turks don't want the world yet to know how extensive their contacts and interactions at the present time are. I'm also going to say that I suspect that they avoided a joint news conference because, as I'm also going to discuss, there are still sensitive issues which um, create pr problems, cause problems between them over Syria and Ukraine and Crimea, for instance, and they don't want to be seen taking public positions against each other as they would be obliged to do in the event that there was a news conference. So in this case, the decision to avoid a news conference and to uh, avoid a joint communique suggests deepening cooperation rather than the opposite. But in case you are thinking that I'm overstating the position uh, between the Russians and the Turks. And in case you think also that what I'm about to say, which is that relations between Turkey and the United States are now fast approaching a point of systemic crisis to the point where it's now debatable whether the, the United States and Turkey can continue as allies any further, then suffice to say that this is increasingly the view also of more and more people around the Middle East and is reflected in a headline in Al Monitor, a US-based website which covers Middle East affairs and does so, I should say, from a very mainstream point of view. And the headline in the article reads, is US-Turkey alliance at a breaking point? Question mark. And then the article goes on to say, the obligatory references to the US and Turkey as NATO allies and partners increasingly fall flat as bilateral relations may be approaching the breaking point over dis differences on Russia and Syria. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan 
who met on September 29th with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin, said that Turkey is not only going to ahead with the purchase of the Russian S-400 missile defense system, which has led to US sanctions, but is considering deeper defense cooperation with Russia, including development of aircraft engines, shipbuilding and warplanes. Erdogan's meeting with Putin followed what Erdogan perceived as a snub from US President Joe Biden during the UN General Assembly meetings in New York last month. Uh, Erdogan would have settled for a photo op and some forced or false or forced or false bonhomie with Biden, especially for at least the illusion of leverage or balance ahead of a meeting with Putin on some prickly issues. It is my hope that as two NATO countries, we should treat each other with friendship, not hostility, Erdogan said in New York. But the current trajectory does not bode well. The point we have reached in our relations with the United States is not good. I cannot say things have gotten off to a good start with Biden. And it seems that in the event, the meeting in New York failed to meet even Erdogan's most pessimistic expectations. He found Biden unengaged and unresponsive. The meeting was very brief. There were none of the photo ops and smiles and bonhomie which perhaps Erdogan was looking for. And he has left the meeting. He left the meeting in New York very unhappy with the state of his relations with the United States. And that shows now in the outcome of what has happened at that meeting in Sochi. And the first thing I'm going to touch on is this, this these comments, which we are also getting from Erdogan it's himself, and which are covered extensively by Al Monitor, about the major arms package with Russia, which may be on the way. And here we read, for example, from a completely separate article on Al Monitor, but which has come out on the same day as the one which we've just I've just been quoting from, that Turkey's president to Erdogan told reporters on Thursday that he discussed expanding cooperation with Russia on a wide array of defence industry endeavours. Despite Turkey's membership in NATO and warnings from the Biden administration about further defence purchases from Moscow, Erdogan said he and Putin discussed moving forward on plans with Russia's S-400 air defence system. Erdogan also touted the possibility of joint production of aircraft engines and unspecified cooperation on warplanes. Another issue is that we can take many steps together in shipbuilding. We will again take joint steps with Russia, including submarines, Erdogan told reporters aboard his plane during his return from Sochi. The Russian president, Erdogan, said offered to build both land and sea-based rocket launch platforms. Erdogan said his counterpart also agreed to cooperate on constructing two nuclear power, power plants in Turkey. So, an enormous arms package, apparently, is pending. We see that the Turks are now talking about buying a second brigade of S-400 missile systems from Russia. They're also looking to Russia for joint production of aircraft engines and fighter jets. Now, here I'm going to say straight away that, in my opinion, the project that, everybody, that the Russians and the Turks have in mind is the Suhoi 75 Checkmate light fighter jet that the Russians displayed at the recent Max air show in August. As I said at the time, my own view about that light fighter jet, which appears to have been cobbled together using technology from the much bigger and more important Sukhoi 57 fifth generation fighter jet, the fighter jet that the Russian Air Force is actually going to use, the purpose of developing the Suhoi 75 Checkmate fighter is to provide countries 
which by the Russian S-400 air defense missile system with an alternative to the American F-35 fifth generation light fighter, which the United States is saying countries cannot buy if they buy the Russian S-400 system. Now, I am not I'm not an expert on military technology and on fighter jet technology. I don't know, and I'm not able to say whether the Sukhoi 75 fighter jet really is an alternative to the F-35. However, the point is that it offers the Russians a package. They can tell countries like Turkey, and by the way, India, will want to buy the S-400 air defense missile system, that if they buy that system, they don't need to worry about the fact that they won't be able to get fifth generation light fighter jets from the United States because the Russians are prepared to supply them with Sukhoi light fighter jets in substitution. And that seems to be the offer the Russians made to Erdogan. And the Erdogan seems to have seized the offer. He wants to buy more S-400 missiles and he's probably going to buy the, S7, the Su-75 light fighter jet. And I suspect that he's angling for and will probably get joint production rights for this fighter jet in Turkey itself. And it goes beyond that because the Russians are apparently also offering Erdogan the option of developing and building submarines. Now, I should say these will almost certainly be, the fact these will definitely be conventional submarines. And the Russians at the moment are producing, as it happens, two lines of conventional submarines. One is the submarine project known as Kilo in the West, but which the Russians call Varshavyanka, which is a, a, apparently a very effective, extremely quiet um, um, conventionally powered submarine, but one which has its origins in Soviet programs in the 1980s. And it's apparently um, it's still a very effective submarine, but I doubt it's the submarine that the Russians and the Turks are talking about in the context of this arms deal that seems to be pending. I suspect that what's actually being discussed is Turkish uh, development or construction of a conventional submarine based on the Russian larder class submarines, of which the first is apparently about to enter service with Russia's northern fleet in the Arctic and North Atlantic, and which is apparently a much more modern and much more advanced conventionally powered submarine than the Varshavyanka. There are rumours, by the way, that the larder class submarine also uses lithium-ion batteries in substitution for its lead-acid batteries, the kind of batteries that um, convent other uh, conventionally powered submarines traditionally used. If that is so, then the larder class submarine is a very advanced submarine indeed. To my knowledge, only the Japanese and the Koreans operate submarines with lithium-ion batteries. And if so, the larder class submarine would have the potential for operating for much longer periods underwater, submerged, than other conventionally powered submarines can do. Anyway, that's, I suspect, the project that the Russians are again offering Turkey. But we also learn from Erdogan's comments that the Russians are offering the Turks with assistance to develop rocket-powered systems that can be operated from submarines, uh, from ships, and which can be land-based. Now, that points clearly to long-range cruise missiles rather than to ballistic missiles. The Russians do not operate ballistic missiles on their surface ships. And I can't imagine that they would want to develop that kind of technology for Turkey. And it's difficult to see what Turkey would want with technology like that. But the Russians do have a, 
three types of um, um, anti-ship missiles, anti-ship cruise missiles, which I suspect the Turks might be interested in. One is the Calibre missile system, which is a long-range cruise missile system, which the Russians have used against the various jihadi groups in Syria. That is a di that's a subsonic system, and it is a direct analogue, a shipboard analogue, for the American Tomahawk cruise missile. An alternative, and perhaps a more likely alternative, given that we're talking about a rocket-based system, would be the Russian Onyx supersonic anti-ship cruise missile, which also has land and sea-based applications. And I suspect that is the system that is being talked about. The Russians, by the way, have used the Onyx as the basis of an uh, anti-ship cruise missile system, a supersonic cruise missile system, the Brahmos, which they have jointly developed with India. And I would not be surprised if the Russians were offering this technology to Turkey also. The third system is, of course, the Zircon hypersonic cruise missile that is a highly advanced, very classified program. I think it is extremely unlikely, to the point of being practically inconceivable, that the Russians would want to share technology of that order of sophistication with Turkey. But an Onyx or Calibre uh, development in Turkey, that is a real possibility. Well, if there is an arms deal on this scale between Russia and Turkey, well, I have to say that at that point, um, I, would, I would guess that Turkey's position as an ally of the United States would not just be in jeopardy, but it would be in existential and total crisis. In truth, I cannot see how Turkey buying such sophisticated weapons from Russia and having set up joint production facilities with the Russians for fighter jets, fighter jet engines and uh, rocket-based missiles and submarines could remain an ally of the United States or even a NATO ally. I would have thought that would be just entirely inconceivable. But one has to ask, what does Erdogan achieve by this, and why is he being pushed increasingly in this direction? And in fact, if we go further, we find that Al Monitor has discussed the problem that Erdogan is facing, and the problem, straightforwardly, is the war in Syria. The situation in Syria is turning increasingly badly. From a Turkish point of view, Turkey is trapped in what looks like a quagmire there. And it seems that that is the leverage that Putin has over Erdogan, and which he is using to try to draw Erdogan ever more closely into the Russian embrace offering Erdogan all these enormously sophisticated weapon systems and all this uh, economic cooperation. Note the offer, for example, for, new, for two more nuclear-powered stations and all the rest as, Erdogan, as Putin works quietly and steadily to detach Turkey from NATO and the United States and to integrate Turkey into the Eurasian power system. And what we uh, learn from Al Monitor is the extent of the crisis between uh, uh, that Turkey is facing in Syria. And there was a very interesting article in Al Monitor dating from the 17th of September, and it reads as follows. Turkey's role in Syria has descended into a 10-year quagmire Assad remains in power, supported by Russia and Iran. Turkey and the US continue to support forces that want to overthrow Assad, or at least hold their ground. But the Biden administration is unlikely to get into the regime change business. Turkey increasingly finds itself at odds with both Washington and Moscow over just about everything. And then the article goes on to say, 
how attempts by Turkey to moderate the various jihadi groups in Idlib province, which it has been supporting, have entirely failed, that those jihadi groups remain as militant as always, how there is a growing crisis in Idlib province with growing indications that the Syrian army is gradually edging forward and may be preparing for a final offensive to clean up Idlib entirely, that Erdogan is extremely worried that this could result in a further refugee flow into Turkey from Syria, adding to the 3.6 million refugees from Syria that are allegedly, I say allegedly because I have some scepticism about that figure, allegedly in Turkey already. And also, of course, Turkey would face a profound and complete humiliation if there was such a Syrian military offensive in Idlib province and if Turkey found itself unable to defeat that offensive. And we learn elsewhere in Al Monitor that there appears to be increasing crisis with the Turkish military um, and the role of uh, over the over Turkey's military role in Syria. And the article reads, top generals step down in top in ominous sign for Turkish military in Syria. Top generals in charge of Turkey's military operations in Syria have sought retirement amid escalating tensions in Idlib, fueling questions over Ankara's Syria policies. And we learn further that Turkey was rattled last week by reports that five generals serving on Syria-related missions were seeking to resign, including the head of a command centre in charge of all Turkish operations in Syria and two others at the helm of commando forces that are deployed in Syria on a rotational basis. An unnamed Defence Ministry official told the state-run Anatolian news agency that only only two generals had asked to retire due to health and familial reasons, and the requests had been granted. The presentation of the two generals' retirement requests as something extraordinary uh, and a sign of problems within the Turkish armed forces is seen as an effort to create perceptions aimed at discrediting the Turkish armed forces, the official was quoted as saying. Still, abrupt re retirement requests by meritorious generals with ample operational experience and bright careers ahead of them are highly unusual in the deep-rooted traditions of the Turkish military, especially in the middle of critical missions. Early retirement requests by such figures can be re read as a gesture of disagreement with their superiors or disapproval of government policies. In the context of Turkey's military intervention in Syria, the following reasons seem likely. The government's Syria policy, or lack thereof, has become so irreconcilable with the operational reality in Syria that commanders are struggling to cover it up on the ground. The government's policy and political directives on Syria have come to significantly jeopardise the safety of Turkish soldiers. And I should say that there's been a steady trickle of casualties of Turkish soldiers in Syria, especially in uh, soldiers in Idlib province, but also elsewhere too. And mid to continue, military commanders and their units are growing increasingly disturbed by the intensity of operations and frequency of rotations. And the overall risk is growing for Turkey in Syria, especially in Idlib, the last stronghold of radical Islamist rebels. Indeed, the situation in Idlib has markedly escalated in recent weeks. Developments in the region suggest that it is becoming harder for thousands of Turkish troops deployed at more than 30 military outposts in Idlib to keep their positions. Intensified air raids by Russian and Syrian warplanes, as well as ongoing Syrian military reinforcements around Sarakib, have made it almost impossible for Turkish military outposts in the area to operate properly, secure logistical supplies, evacuate sick 
or wounded soldiers or pr patrol critical routes. So here we have reports that either two or five, I'm going to say frankly that I think it's almost certainly five. I don't, I suspect that these attempts to, by the Turkish authorities to downplay what has happened by pretending that it's only two. Almost certainly five Turkish generals re resigning is a sign that there is growing restiveness within the military about the presence of Turkish troops in Idlib and in Syria. And I would add that Al Monitor reports that this um, resignation of generals is taking place at the same time as there appears to be an ongoing purge of middle-ranking officers from the Turkish military. And we read as follows, controversy over the Turkish military's personnel management has been further fanned by reports about a record number of colonels being forced into early retirement, around 200 at the Supreme Military Council in August and 600 at last year's council. Overstaffing at the rank of colonel has long been an issue for the Defence Ministry, but the measures taken have resulted in highly unfair procedures. The service term of military officers was lim limited to 28 years in 2016, and a promotion to general now requires a decision by the Supreme Military Council, regardless of age and length of service. Those who are not promoted could be sent into retirement as early as their 40s, despite their involuntary retirements, and would have to wait until the age of 50 to receive pensions. Hundreds of colonels have reportedly been affected by the policy, left without financial means and social security until the age of 50, after at least 50 years, 20 years of military service. And so we see a very harshly pursued purge of middle and ranking officers happening alongside retirement of senior military officers, of general people of general rank from the Turkish military. Growing signs, in other words, of disaffection within the army and of the government in Turkey taking steps to maintain its grip on the army with growing indications that a lot of this is founded upon disaffection within the Turkish military about the long Turkey, the long-standing presence of Turkish troops in Idlib province and elsewhere in Syria. Now, I should say that the Turkish military, the Turkish general staff, consistently opposed and successfully opposed pressure from Erdogan to intervene in Syria up to the point of the 2016 coup attempt. When the coup attempt took place, Erdogan was able to replace many of the top generals in the Turkish military, who up to that point had opposed Turkish military intervention in Syria. And he was able to use that fact to send Turkish troops into Syria something he'd always hankered to do, but had not been able to do up to that point. What he has discovered is that the advice of those Turkish generals who told him before 2016 that sending troops into Syria was a bad idea is turning out to be true. Turkey is trapped in a quagmire in Syria, to use uh, um, Al Monitor's point, uh, uh, it's finding itself um, uh, facing a crisis in Idlib province. Its attempts to get the jihadi groups in, in Idlib province to clean up their act have failed. And it's seeing that its military position in Idlib province is becoming increasingly precarious. So Erdogan has to find some means, it would appear, to extricate himself from that kind of crisis in Idlib province without losing face. And at the same time, he finds that he has another crisis in, in another part of Syria, which I discussed in my previous programme, with US support for the Kurdish militia in northeast Syria, something which uh, Erdogan 
is known to be increasingly unhappy about. And the extent to which Erdogan is unhappy about this has become increasingly clear since the meeting, that failed meeting with Biden. He's actually spoken in the most extraordinary terms about what the US is doing in, Syri in, in northeast Syria. He's made it clear that he wants the uh, US to pull out of northeast Syria and to end its support for the Kurdish militia there. And he's even gone further and he's actually spoken about the uh, fact that he regards the uh, US officials supporting the Kurdish militia as supporting terrorists. He said on 29 September, that's um, on the eve of his summit meeting with Putin, that Brett McGurk, the US National Security Council coordinator for the Middle East and North Af Africa, is actually supporting terrorism. He is a director of the Kurdish PKK and NYPG, the two militia groups, the two Kurdish militia groups, one, the PKK, and the other, the YPG, which are closely connected with each other, one, which is a militia group in Syria, the other, a militia group in Turkey, which has had a history of fighting the Turkish military. So that's very strong words, in effect accusing a senior US official of supporting terrorism. Well, so what it seems to me is in the works is some kind of grand deal. The Turks pull out of Idlib province, some kind of arrangement is made to avoid a massive onrush of refugees into Turkey. There is, again, according to Al Monitor, a, a considerable amount of disquiet in Turkey itself about the presence of Syrian refugees in Turkey and growing anti-immigrant feeling about this in Turkey itself. And that is one of the factors that is eroding Erdogan's support in Turkey. So he wants to avoid another refugee flow and he wants to find some means to try to get many of those refugees, presumably to return to Syria. And so he wants an end to the war in Syria. He wants to, that means he's going to have to come to some kind of terms with Assad in Damascus, but he wants that finessed through some kind of constitution and formula, which is much talked about and which will allow him to be able to withdraw from Idlib without losing face. And in return, he wants the US withdrawing entirely from northeast Syria. He wants the Syrians to reestablish their positions in northeast Syria. And he wants the Kurdish militia brought back under Syrian control. And the Russians, in return, want to facilitate all of this. And they're telling the Kurds in northeast Syria that the way to arrange all of this is for them to come to some kind of deal with Damascus. It's an enormously complicated and intricate deal that seems to be in the works um, over Syria to end the Syrian war. But I would say that if anybody can pull it off, it's probably Putin with the help of his officials. And to seal the deal, the Turks will get this enormous military uh, um, military um, deal with the Russians and they'll also get help from the Russians with their industrial economy, those nuclear power stations and all the rest. Well, as I said, if all this happens, if we see the end of the Syrian war on the kind of terms that I've talked about, if we see the sort of grand deal in the works if we see the Turks and the Russians reaching all these enormous military agreements that I've discussed, then I have to say straightforwardly, it seems to me the Turkey's position as a US and NATO ally is dead. I cannot imagine, I cannot conceive of a NATO ally, an ally of the United States that buys weapon systems on this scale from the United States' adversary, from NATO's enemy, which is Russia, 
it seems to me that the position would be completely irreconcilable. And at that point, we would see Turkey no longer an ally of the United States, presumably a Turkey that would leave NATO, because as I said, all of this seems to me entirely irreconcilable with Turkish membership of NATO. And of course, we would see the end of the, all those US bases in Turkey, in Chilik and all the rest. Is this all going to happen? I mean, is this actually going to take place? Well, it seems to me that we are closer to that point than we've ever been, much closer than I would have expected. There are still problems. First of all, one does wonder whether or not this is going to be acceptable in Turkey, whether opposition to these moves in Turkey would be so strong that perhaps Turkey might find it difficult or Erdogan might find it difficult to sell these agreements to the Turkish people. However, I would say that, you know, one can't be certain. Erdogan is nothing if not a survivor. And I suspect that many Turks actually would probably support these changes were they to happen. There would be economic consequences. I suspect Turkey would face severe sanctions from the United States. But against that, Turkey probably would find that it can also get a great deal of economic support from China and Russia in order to seal this deal. So who knows, might be just possibly this might happen. But consider the bigger question, the, the underlying issue, which is here again we see how badly the United States under this administration and indeed previous administrations has managed its affairs. This war in Syria, instead of leading to the overthrow of President Assad's government, has resulted in events taking place which are putting the membership of Turkey in NATO in jeopardy. Turkey being, of course, a vital US ally. Um, on top of all of that, we've seen a massive expansion in Russian influence in the Middle East. In Syria, where the Russians now have this massive base in um, in Khmeimim and in Tartus, this massive base complex, and we've seen this huge increase in Russian influence in Turkey. We've seen Iran forging alliances with Russians and China, partly because of this um, connection to uh, this connection that they forged with Russia and China in Syria. We see Chinese foreign minister visiting Syria. And we see now Turkey all increasingly becoming sceptical about its relationship with the United States. And on top of all of that, we see how maladroit US policy has become. We see Biden unwilling to engage with Erdogan in any meaningful way, and the United States obsessively sticking by the Kurds, even as its position with Turkey, its key NATO ally in the region, collapses. Whatever one may think of the US and its foreign policy, it has not been handling things well. And it is this which is now, more than anything else, leading to the collapse of its position in this part of the Middle East. It's also, to my mind, a sign of how neocon wars end invariably badly for the US. The neocon war in Afghanistan has ended with the total collapse of the US position in Central Asia. The neocon war in Syria, or at least the neocon sponsored intervention in Syria, is now endangering the US position in the Western Middle East along the Mediterranean coast. It's an extraordinary story and it's one that the United States doesn't seem to be learning any lessons from. But anyway, it's clear that events are in motion in the, near, in the Middle East to an extent which I straightforwardly would never once have imagined. The idea that Turkey 
which seems so anchored in its alliance with the West, with NATO and with the United States, would now be edging so close to forging an entirely new relationship with Russia would have been inconceivable to me just a few years ago. And what we see is, yes, skillful Russian foreign policy, skillful Russian manoeuvring, making the most of this and playing a role in gradually detaching Turkey increasingly from its alliances with the United States and NATO, but perhaps more importantly, the United States making a whole succession of unforced errors which have been pushing Turkey away. If this turns out as it is increasingly threatening to do, then all I can say is that we will have long years of detailed studies in the United States with lots of people there agonising about how it came to happen that the United States lost Turkey. Well, we're not quite there yet, but as I said, we're closer than we have ever been. Well, thank you for joining me today for this programme on this subject. I look forward to you joining me in future programmes on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo. Please also remember to check out Alex's own channel. You'll find links under this video. Please also remember to check us out on our new platforms, above all locals, where we are now increasingly publishing exclusive content, where we have a thriving community at which you can join and in which you can actively participate in and engage with us, Alex and myself, increasingly directly, including, I should say, on live streams. You can also uh, find us on our various other platforms, especially the new free speech platform, SuperU, but also on BitChute, uh, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, and all the rest. You can also support us by uh, uh, through via Patreon and Subscribestar, and by coming to our shop, uh, buying yourself the famous magic mugs. Here's one with the picture of that consummate da diplomat, Mr. Lavrov. And also, you can buy our T-shirts, our sweatshirts, our hoodies, our hats, and all the rest. And um, lastly, if you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button. And please, of course, check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, um, I look forward to you joining me again shortly. And have a wonderful day. Until then.